And here we have the man, the myth, the legend, Mike Porman, uh, our old professor, one of our old professors and a great good friend of, friend of mine now. Hack and I were just saying, you know, we respect you a lot. We know you're well-respected. We've been covering Penn State for a long time. So, you know, what better than to have you on the pod, man? And Christian, I don't know if you remember this, but I still have your paper where you wrote a paper on it should be athlete student. And you talked about all the responsibilities, the time management. I mean, it was ahead of its time, given given what's going on with NIL. My mom was an English teacher, so uh, for, for my, few, my few pieces of what I could do uh, in the world of academia, I always felt strongly about my writing. What's up, everybody? If you are a college football fan like me, if you know a college football fan that's in your life, you need to go cop this shirt. New designs dropping all the time. It's the perfect gift with the holiday season coming around. If you don't have this thing, you're missing out. Great material, great fabric. I wear it all the time. Go get yours today. Folks, and we're back again with The Pocket. Uh, bittersweet here, man. We we ended the Penn State season last week or two weeks ago, whatever it was. And uh, now it's officially over. Right. The whole thing. <laughs> Um, Michigan's Michigan's uh, dancing up there. They're throwing a party. Up the uh, you know, I guess again, also bittersweet. Happy it's in the Big <laughs> Ten. Happy we got to see a preview of what's going to be a Big Ten matchup moving forward. Um, but yeah, man, it's been a hell of a year. I know we talked about this just from a Penn State scope, but I mean, just college football in general. There's a lot of changes coming. There's a lot of things that are moving parts. You know, the the, the, the playoff expansion next year. So, dude, I just I just want to take a moment again of just appreciation and gratitude for everyone who's tuned in and yeah. you know showing support. Um, it's been great, B, and I've I've I, I've loved doing this with you for sure. You know, I, I think we always skip out on that. You know yeah, what I mean? Like, man, and. and <laughs> You know, it's like we have one of those relationships where we could not talk for a year, two and a half years, three years. We get back together. It's like we never skipped a beat. Right. I think a lot of guys are like that. So it's always good just to have that weekly reminder and the weekly check in. And it's been it's been a lot of fun, man. So I just want to echo that. A hundred percent, man. Grateful, grateful for you. Grateful for uh, Mercury State Media and the fans. You guys been tuning in. I appreciate. It. You know, I know we keep talking about it. We're going to be up there in State College a little bit more. You know, love running into people. Hey, I love the pod. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, it's a great feeling. So definitely a um, moment of gratitude. I, can't, I kind of can't believe that the season's over. You know, I think back to August when we just kicked this thing off, talking about all the crazy stuff that was happening then, and then now we're here. And as you said, Michigan did it. <sighs> a little bittersweet. I'm not going to lie. I, I don't think I subscribe to the whole – you know, a Big Ten winner, whoop de doo for everyone. You know, <laughs> yeah. it's a oh, little. I'm with you. <laughs> but, you think that there's an asterisk with this, with right. all the scandals going on? Do you think that there is going to be that question mark? <sighs> nah, man. It may be. It may spin in the media for a few more days, pop up yeah. randomly here and there. But I think Harbaugh. You know, it, it'll be it'll be tossed under the rug, and you know. But kudos to them. You know, I, I'm happy for the kids and. You know, it's a Michigan balled out. You can't deny, you can't deny the defense. Although we talk about the scandals, but the defense, they 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 won the championship. Defense wins championships, and they did. Obviously, offense did a great job. The running backs, man, uh, bittersweet still though. I don't want to talk about Michigan too much. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, we can't can't give <laughs> too much airtime. But we we are going to dive into the game a little bit here. But yeah, man, it's um. You know, the other thing is, is, you know, what I'm stoked about from this year is just the involvement we've had and being able to provide a platform for the Letterman. And, yeah. You know, now me being full time with state media and, and really trying to, like, paint a picture and a vision of what I want, what, what I think we all want this to be. Yeah. And, you know, you being a part of that, like continuing to get guys that played there involved here and a voice and a platform. I think it's what fans want. You know, you you guys can obviously correct me if I'm wrong here in the DMs and in the in the mentions, but being able to provide a full view on everything from every angle, from every era, and kind of get that collective rallying cry and provide a channel for us to have a voice um, 
to ultimately like from everything from like what we're seeing and analyzing for fans down to like some stuff I've seen you do all throughout the year this year of little words of wisdom. I don't know if these players tune in. They probably don't, but if they start listening or whatever, like just the little words of wisdom, man, like it's, it's super valuable and something that I wish I had tapped into more when I was up there, just like listening to the old heads and, and their experiences. And, you know, you see, you see guys like Steph doing great things out in the community, just like, just that awareness. It's, it's so, it's so powerful. And, you know, like, like we've always said, like this Letterman group gets so tight. Like yeah. once you leave, you realize how tight it is, but it's hard to realize it when you're playing. So right. just continue to create a, create a platform for us to, to bridge that gap quicker. And um, I think, I think it's super powerful. So. Yeah, definitely. I mean, as, as you said it, you know, we were once those guys sitting in the meeting room and having the OGs come in and talk to us. Not that we didn't listen. It's just, you don't know until you know, which is usually, you know, years down the line when you're no longer wearing the, the blue and white. Um, so, you know, it's, we got to keep pushing, like you said, you know, keep uh, sending the messages and just build that connect between the current, the past and the future. And I think that's exactly what we're we're here meant to do here in the pocket. So looking forward to it. We're going to keep this thing rolling. More guests, you know, it's going to be some names. You know, we've uh, we've we've keyed in on a few guys, and there's just so many. Honestly, every every single player and every single year, we know every team's different each year. Everyone has a story. You know, some you know play a bigger role in Penn State history than others, but everyone's story is important. I definitely want to echo that as well. Um, obviously, we can't have all you know 400 of our teammates over the years come on, but you know, we definitely I, I like the. When I see guys around tailgate, the conversations I have, you know, I'm, I'm taking little bits and pieces of those conversations to bring here and just, you know, in the memory bank, the knowledge bank, you know, it's all, it's all part of the brand, I think. And I'm excited for this, man. And this is going to be the first off season, you know, first off, season. Yeah. got to figure this out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, uh, I know, I know the people listening, they're, they're rocking with us and, um, that's why we like to include you guys a lot for you guys listening, you know, because it's 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 a community thing, really. You know, from the players yeah. to the fans that make the players, you know, make the games exciting, to be honest. You know, I can't I always say this to young guys. I cannot imagine those COVID years, which were the only really down years we had as a program, which most teams did. Um I can't imagine playing in an empty Beaver Stadium or freaking empty yeah. Rucker Stadium, whatever it may be. Like that's that's whack. <laughs> it's so weird, dude. It's so weird. I mean, it gives you like those those scrimmage vibes that we right, had when right. we go scrimmage during camp and stuff. <laughs> yeah, it was always always awkward. But yeah, so let's 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 trickle back. Let's get back on track here. Uh, that was good, but let's let's get back on track. We want to cover the national championship game, and then um, Brandon and I are bringing a guest on today. It's a little bit. I guess you could say off brand from the Letterman uh, side of things, but a guy who I think both of us have a ton of respect for. He's been covering Penn State for a really long time. He teaches up at school, Mike Poorman. So um, we're going to get his thoughts, some of his old old war stories. Maybe get him to maybe get him to dive into what you and I were like as students. Right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you one one blip of a story. I'll bring it up when we get him on. Um, yeah. He looked out, but he he definitely made his work for it. I don't know if you remember. Oh, yeah. oh for sure. You know, he, oh, for sure, dude. So it, it was – but it's good. So I, I, I'm actually really excited about this, like right. I said, because I, I have a ton of respect for the way Mike covers the program and the way he covered me personally and I think all of us. Um, and it was uh, – it's just – I think it's going to be really cool. Um, so uh, before that, though, the national championship game um, – you know, it, it was, I think, what a lot of us expected. You know, like I said, like I hinted at, um, the, uh, the, 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 the fortuitous aspect of this of like Washington now coming to the Big Ten with yeah. Oregon. You know, David yeah. Landing mentioned it on the pregame show. Like he's like, I'm really excited about this because I'm going to be playing both of these teams next year, uh, which I thought was pretty unique, but, right. um, it ultimately gets it done. You know, for me, I have a couple thoughts, but I, I, I want to get to yours. You know, what what are your immediate takeaways um, from the game, both sides, Washington and 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 Michigan, and then ultimately any final thoughts you have regarding you know the way Michigan did it, how they did it, whatever. Yeah, I mean, 
like you like we said in the beginning, you got to give props where props are due. Michigan, they played their brand of football all year, and it took them to the big dance. And they to complete the big dance, they did exactly what they did all year. So you got to give them props. You know, looking back, at, you know, reflecting on ourselves as Penn State, we talk about you know, uh, not style, but you know, the brand of football that we're going to play, the uh, uh, identity. Identity, yeah, exactly. Sorry, blink. And, I mean, it doesn't have to be. Obviously, Michigan is going to be Michigan. We're going to be whatever we're going to be. But that that's what I'm looking when I'm watching that game. Even Washington, you know, obviously they came up short, but they played their brand of football throughout the year, obviously undefeated until the big dance. But, you know, kudos to them too. Shouts out to them. They battled. And they just ha- they missed on the plays they needed. You know, we talked about that margin of error was slimmer yeah. for Washington than Michigan, obviously, with just the style of play. And they were there. Now, a lot of people want to talk about the refs, but excluding that, you know, the moments were there where they really need to capitalize to really kind of keep it closer and then have a chance at the end. But, you know, Michael Penix, you know, was battling out there. Taking hits left and right, he said his ribs were all bruised up. But it was it was a fun game. I know the receivers definitely challenged those DBs, but Michigan DBs they're they're legit. You know they got yeah. three, four NFL guys. You know across the bat that you know played tight, played played tight, and they got the job done. You know Michigan, Michigan, the Michigan way. Yeah, I think I think you bring up a couple of things and some points there that we should dive into. But like to your point, Michigan came out. And played phenomenal defense. They got to it. They got off to a great start with what they are on offense. I mean, they're right. a ball control offense that runs the football. And the the explosives that Donovan Edwards produced early in that game were obviously huge. Yeah. And then Blake Corum just being the steady Eddie. Like I've I've fallen in love with his game and and how he plays. Like he's he's really good. Corum. And it's going to translate to league Corum. Yeah. Like he's really really good. Yeah. Just short area quickness, balance. Uh, tough, like he always falls forward. Like right. there's just a lot to to really like about his game. Like I'm pro, like he's probably not going to run a four 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 three. Right. Like he's not going to be a burner. But like when you turn on his tape, he's a flat out football player. And I really, really um, hope that NFL GMs are evaluating him from that and not necessarily like how he tests and things like that. Right. Like I could be wrong, but sure. Uh, I'm not nowadays, these kids, man, you yeah. know, they get in the facility for two months. They might be, he might jump out on a four, four, four. I won't say four, three, yeah. but you know. Yeah. And I gotta give him a lot of more props because I've seen the Donovan Edwards kid the last two years. I'm like, yo, that kid has it, which he He's does, explosive. but not yeah. to take away from Blake because you know he has juice too. It's just not maybe not long speed, but he definitely, like you said, that short area quickness. You know, I can. He see reminds me of like Emmett Smith. I've mm-hmm. said this before. Like the way his game is, like he just never gets squared up. Right. Like he's small target, like. He he just play he runs behind his pads like he's just yeah a little bit I, obviously I, like a big comparison but like no yeah that's I, I see a little uh, I see a little Ray Rice a little bit yeah you know, a little bit of a bowling yeah. ball yeah. stature strong and this shoot well also for the fans Hack and I are going to get into a little mock draft you know NFL comp along the way here for our guys and around the uh, college football landscape so also look out for that you know I think yeah. we. We both have a good eye for, you know, talent. I'll just say that, you know, when it comes to ball. But then, you know, you also brought up a point. Like, I thought Michigan, on on the Washington side of things, like Washington stuck to who they were, mm-hmm. like you said. Like, I think that's vitally important. I think teams that are at that level, like, have a have a better understanding than everybody else of what their identity is and what they can rely on. And – no matter what the peaks and valleys that a game may present, for example, like giving up two massive explosives and mm-hmm. being down two scores quick, like they kept battling. And then when you when you start looking at like the game of football, they got the ball back before half. They took up some time. They gave Michigan like 42 seconds. They ended up scoring a touchdown on fourth down. One score game going into halftime. They're getting the ball back out of halftime. Like that was a great uh, like like coaching philosophy and like managing the game. Yeah. Um, and then the interception didn't help him coming out, but then it was really just a back and forth game for that third quarter. And like Michigan was just grinding it out. Right. You know, they haven't ever put the ball in JJ's hands to like go and win them a game with explosives. I don't think that's really his game either. And like, 
you know, kudos to them for sticking with who they were. But then it's, it was almost like just waiting for Michigan, for, for Washington to slip up because right. Washington's game and style was throwing the football. And like Michigan was like, we're, we're pretty confident that it's going to give us something here. Right. And then it ended up going out that way later on, you know, you get the holding after the explosive, puts them behind the sticks. Like it just felt like Washington was in second and third and long, like all game long. Yeah. And you know, that's a tough, it's a tough position to be in. Even a guy like Michael Penix, who I think, throughout this playoff run has made a case to be the first quarterback taken. He's the more I watch him, he's really, really good. He's deadly accurate. Obviously he missed some things in this game that yeah. he hasn't done characteristic, but you brought up some great points, like being banged up, like your ribs hurting. That's, that's <laughs> pretty, it's a pretty important thing when you're throwing a football and, you know, he showed a lot of toughness and, and, and fight and battle. And I give them a lot of credit. And then ultimately, you know, Michigan ends up pulling away with a late pick and some, 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 you know, kind of garbage time touchdowns that pulled it, pulled it, made it look, I think, different than the game right, was. Right, but right. I was really happy with it. And, um, you know, again, for me, like Donovan Edwards, Blake Corum, like deserve team MVPs, put a freaking statue out in front of the stadium of those two guys because that run <laughs> was fantastic. Like Blake, again, like I said, like just, just a really, really good football player. I have a ton of respect for him individually. Right. Like if I was to, guy on Michigan's team that I have the utmost respect for it's it's him I think he's just really tough would be an old would be one of those ultimate teammates as coach Frank would right. say for me so, right yeah and they, uh, had, they had a, a few guys that you know like you said those two and the QB are the three names you and most other countries gonna know I'll say just the two Blake Holm and McCarthy the two names you're gonna know but what I like, you know, they had guys step up that maybe aren't, you know, household names. The tight end, Loveland, you know, the receivers, they all, you know, stepped up when their when their when their number was called uh, and made some big plays. And I'm sure if we had the tape, you know, we can go back and watch the plays that aren't, you know, the catches, the blocks, you know, the the, the yeah. cutouts and cutoffs and things of that nature. So, yeah. Once again, I mean, they did what they had to do to take it all home. And I know a lot of people's out of hoop love, like, you know, the teams that were left out, you know, i.e. the Bulldogs. Uh, a lot of people have a lot to say about what that game could have been like, which obviously we'll never know. Uh, but it is yeah. college football is, is, is in good hands. Well, like I said, we'll find out next year. And that's, that's going to be really fun, right? right? Like it's going to leave nothing to be, I think, uh, argued upon right like everything's going to be everything's going to be out there right. you're going to have to earn it um for a couple rounds now and i think i think that's that's ultimately good i think it prepares the kids for what's coming right. the guys that are going to the nfl you know i think it's just that alignment i think long term is is probably um better for the for for everybody involved in the whole process but you know yeah, there it is, dude. Uh, you know, second, second. I think SEC and Big Ten have won pretty much every. Am I wrong here? They've won every college football playoff now. Every, yeah, I think so. Since its inception, right? So that's second. You know, we're we're catching up. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> we're catching up. Um, I mean, the more this thing realigns in the transfer portal, I think it may it may even out over these next few. I mean, yeah. I mean, I don't know. We'll see. Like we said, Georgia still looks pretty darn good. Alabama was yeah. still in the picture, um, but you know, think things will even out for sure. Yeah, no doubt. So. Um, yeah, again, to kind of put a bow on this, great season, been awesome, been awesome covering it. Um, you know, excited for our boys next year and everything we got going on. I think the portal's been doing doing pretty well with the Nolan Rucci grab yeah, and yeah. The, uh, Julian Fleming. So when there's some other noise there that could potentially pop off here in the next couple of days. So that's it's been uh, it's been fun tracking that, but um, you know. Hail to the victors for now. They get the crown, and and uh, yeah, I think everyone's going to be itching for for August to come around yeah. and preseason talk and training camps and, and ultimately that first kickoff towards the end of the month there, beginning of September. So it's motivation, um, man. It's motivation. Yeah, man. <laughs> so with that, with that being said, um, you got any closing remarks? No, man. Beautiful. You know, college football is a beautiful en entity, you know, needs some work, you know, as everything does, but I'm excited for what, what's coming in 2024. And, uh, yeah, I want to hear uh, the legendary Mike Poorman's thoughts. You know, yeah. Let's get our guy in here. He's um, 
it's gonna it's gonna be cool. I've 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 done a few of these with media members, and it always turns out really really good. So yeah, um, yeah. Portman is very have- very beloved. Knows his stuff and covering Penn State for a long time. Fan favorite amongst the students, which uh, is something we want to talk to him about, and really alumni too. You know, he does a lot. You know, oh. alumni base, keeping the kind of Belisario College together. You know, networking events of that nature. So, without further ado, Mike Porman. And here we have the man, the myth, the legend, Mike Porman, uh, our old professor, one of our old professors, and a great, good friend, of, friend of mine now, post college. You know, we finally. Uh, Finally got that beer we have been talking about for a while, and it's uh it's kind of nice to have you as a peer somewhat now. You know, kind of see you as more of the relationship that way. Hack and I were just saying, you know, we respect you a lot. We know you well respected. Been covering Penn State for a long time, so you know what better than to have you on the pod, man. You know, you're a listener, so it's our pleasure to have you here on the pocket. Well, thanks for having me. You know, uh, it was when we had that. Beer at Cafe 210, and then you hopped on the bike and drove across campus. I admire your uh, physical abilities to do that. Uh, um, but you guys are, and I was thinking about this, you guys were true student athletes. You were engaged, you were smart, really thoughtful. And Christian, I don't know if you remember this, but I still have your paper where you wrote a paper on it should be athlete student. And you mm-hmm. talked about all the responsibilities, the time management. I mean, it was ahead of its time, given given what's going on with NIL. And you weren't looking for money. You were sharing, I thought, and, really, and I saved it. I, I've had thousands of students. Your, your insight and your honesty, and not a way of complaining, but of explaining, it was, it was, a, it was a great piece. Uh, and obviously, I still remember it. <laughs> I think I, I think I remember that because we had, you know, the whole Northwestern team trying to unionize at that point in time, um, which is really interesting now too. like the direction. I think this is ultimately going to head right. with, uh, you know, revenue sharing and stuff like that. I don't know if the current student athletes really understand the entirety of what that's going to look like um, paying union dues and stuff like that. But uh <laughs> it is it is interesting and I do appreciate that. My mom was an English teacher, so uh um, for, for my few my few pieces of what I could do uh in the world of academia, I always felt strongly about my writing. So I, I appreciate that sentiment there. I can burn <laughs> well, I'm gonna give you a sh- shout out, B Bell too, two ways is you've done a great job uh, of staying in touch and really we are colleagues and peers these days and I, I really appreciate that. And I got to tell you, one of my, I've been teaching this my 25th years, was a career highlight when Big Ten did something on you and you gave me a shout out on oh, air. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, <laughs> I got to that stuff matters. I, I got to yeah. tell you, it matters. I still remember it. Um, yeah, you guys are memorable on and off the field. Thank you. Thank you. Shoot. Uh, going back to Con 170, you know, the uh, great communications class that you teach or the professor, and we were talking about it. You know, we teach you what we're, you're kind of, um, as you said, you have 5,000 students. And, you know, we said about 75, you know, football players over your time so far. And as we know, you cover football. And a lot of people like to think, oh, professors let the guys off, you know, let them do their thing. But no, you, I remember it was one weekend. I forget what happened exactly. But we had to, class was disrupted from our football, by our football schedule. And we had something to do. And we kind of thought like, oh, he'll let us, you know, we'll get a pass on this one. No, no, no. You, you, you altered it a little bit. We still had to turn something in that Friday. Um, and you, but you gave us a chance to obviously still get credit. I can't remember exactly what it was. I have to talk to Pook or, or Hammy. I think all of us were in that class together. But I remember Speaking of that Hamilton. Whole, yeah, yeah. Do you they, remember when he, he taught half the lesson one day on stadiums? He got up to the podium, taught the lesson. And the other guy, I think he was in favor of stadiums. And the other guy who got up and taught the other half of the lesson was the Nittany Lion. Um, mm. that's a, to me, that's a great thing about the class. Football players, all athletes, the Lion, you know, kids in media. You know, one of one of your professional colleagues, Doc, man, yeah. uh, sat, sat in the front row, super engaged, super smart. Um, 
No, I have two roles. Uh, one during the, during this semester, whatever sport you are, I can't write about you. Um, that's a conflict of interest, um, mm. which is a challenge sometimes for the fall. And, and the other other rule, and I think this goes back. And Christian, I'm really impressed about the Northwestern and, and culture and remembering that because that's when I teach that. That's that's really the, in many ways the beginning. So. Um, we're definitely paying attention then and now. But the other thing is, is that I, my role has always been, and hopefully you guys will bear this out. If the regular non-athletic student can do it, so can the student who's playing athletics. And, and that should be the rule for everything that decides everything, the expectations, but also the opportunities and the challenge. If for me, that's always been my run rule. It's the same rule for everybody. And if Look, if a kid wants to, who's a comm major wants to, I'm going to go on, transfer from, from ship to Temple to Pitt to Penn State, he can do it. Right. So if a football player wants to do it or a basketball player, I'm all in favor of the same rules for everybody. That makes it really easy. Right. Well, that's interesting you bring all that stuff up, Mike, because I was going to ask you kind of about your relationship obviously covering the team and we've mentioned a couple of your articles this year because I, I I personally love your thoroughness with numbers and statistics and historical background you do a really good job of of, of bringing it all together and tying it all in at, just as a consumer now for me and um, throughout your time covering you mentioned some conflicts of interest and so on and so forth but what what have you seen like I feel like one of the main reasons why I came to Penn State and then ultimately stayed at Penn State when I did was just like the aspect of of the old school ways with Joe, like of caring about the entirety of the person, not just what they do on the field. And your relationship is obviously a unique one from that perspective where you've seen so many generations now of Penn State football players, both in the classroom and then covering them on the field. Kind of dive into that as well a little bit if you can and, and add some more color to that, because I, I just I truly think that not a lot of people get to see that whole picture and you have a war chest of information regarding that and again specifically at a place like Penn State that I think really does a fantastic job of pushing you in all aspects and has done that at least when I was there I, I mean I don't know so much now but um, you know it, it's something that I did cherish even though I was the guy sitting in the corner with my hood up maybe not <laughs> no you know uh, can I tell you, you know? this story about you Christian Ooh. um no, it's a good one, but it's an interesting. Um, and um, I'll just the first thing your your one point first, and I'm going to talk about you a little bit, Christian. Is uh, um, I try to rely on statistics and history. I'm ever mindful. I get a paycheck from Penn State. Even the thing I wrote about James last week, I said like third graph. I work for Penn State, um, but the fact that James made nine point oh eight five million dollars. I did the work and figured it out. You can't, uh, you know, and one of my old germ profs said, did you get any blowback? And I go like, no, actually, um, I got heard from a million people, but no, because it's true. Right. <laughs> That's always my defense, you know. So I won't give you a lot of opinion, but I'll give you a lot of information. And hopefully you'll take that opinion or that history and then um, extrapolate what you think out of it. I mean, if James has made $64 million, more power to him. Um, but then also, hopefully that inspires some thinking on your own or the reader's own point on what does that $64 million mean? I remember you, Christian, first day of class or beginning, you sat in second row and there was an answer about lacrosse. And I go like, how do you know that? I didn't know who you were. And you turn and go like, I'm from Virginia. You, you probably don't remember that. But as the season went on, as the season, B Bell always sat in the same seat. He was super reliable and consistent. That's who Brandon is. But you hopped around the classroom as the season went on as you were trying to find yourself. And I've never shared that with anyone, but I was insightful to me. And I certainly would never write that. That's not fair to you. Um, but it was interesting to see. And that happens with other kids who aren't starting quarterbacks, but it's easier to track your progress. So I, right. I am lucky that I have that insight, but it's also kids who broadcast for Com radio 
or or cover for Onward State, it's the same thing. I'm really I'm really lucky to teach that class because anybody who's involved in sports in Penn State, they end up in that class. I do a survey yeah. at the start of class, um, mandatory. Over 80% every semester they want to work in the sports industry. So I'm going to touch upon, like today, there's the editor of Onward State, and there's the beat writer for collegiate football, and there's a football yeah. player I won't name. They're all in the front row. You, you know, you can't escape it. But here's right. the other thing. They bring everybody – uh, my TA last semester was a cheerleader. They all bring something very interesting to the table. Um, and they make they make the class better that way. And it's my job to tap into all of that, um, not just the football players, but everyone who's involved in, involved in sports at Penn State. So it does give me a, a unique view, but I'm also very careful, careful that I, you know, I feel comfortable telling you that story now, but I would never write it. Unless I talk to yeah, you right. about it. Right. That's a, uh, I respect that. I commend that. And honestly, what the point you brought up too is, is a, is a larger scale, but just the ability to force people to critically think, I think is, uh, is very commendable as well. That's something I respect. And we have, we have to keep that in this, uh, ever growing, you know, culture or whatever you want to call it, that this country is in, you know, to critically think for yourself as well. Add yeah. on to that. <laughs> but um with that being said mike you know like i said you've covered penn state for years uh you've you've been obviously hyper involved recently with with some numbers and figures you know the one thing that brandon and i've talked about and we've shared about this like part of part of us launching state media has been um you know providing a platform for former lettermen to give their state of the program, their input, their insights, experiences, whatever, for anybody listening, because I think it's really unique. And if you see, you know, this may be something, the shift in consumption, uh, the consumption model across, you know, ESPN and all the major networks is former players because mm-hmm. they have a unique perspective that that not a lot of folks can, can give and fans really want to hear that. So that's part of the reason why we're doing this. But then also for you, like, I, I wanted to bring you in here because of everything we just highlighted, but when you look at this season, we brought up a lot of points that that we felt were expectations were here, sometimes weren't quite met, like covering the team and, and seeing the, the weekly press conferences and things like that, like the temperature, because I really don't think that any of the issues that we have as a program right now are personnel issues like we were dealing with when we were at school in terms of the sanctions and trying to rebuild a roster, like even a, the coaching staff issues, the carousel, like that's that's one thing. But there's been a lot of consistency in terms of what Coach Franklin wanted. So like overall this season, like I'm not going to ask you to say like failure or, or not or whatever, but what was what was your feeling covering the team from week one all the way until the Peach Bowl? <clears throat> And then we're going to kind of shift that into, you know, projections because we are solution based folks here and we want to see what 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 your thoughts may be and heading into 2024, what this team needs to do to ultimately compete in a beefed up Big Ten conference. I do like that solutions. And let me give you a little shout out. Very, very. I mean, I'm a purveyor, as we talked about maybe before you went on the air. I'm a purveyor of you guys talking. I learn a lot from you. Same thing with. Dawkins, and I guess he's state media too. Same yep. thing with with his podcast. I mean, it can be an outside person, me looking at it, but learning from your perspective and learning from Nick's perspective and, and Jerry's and somewhat of Aeneas's, I've learned a lot. I've, you know, I've been around the, I, my first class at Penn State was with Jeff, was an English class with Jeff Hostetler and Danny Rocco. So that's how far I go back. And he turned out to be a pretty good quarterback. And, you know, Danny's Mm -hmm. a great coach. Um, This past season, um, the defense was NFL quality. They had a mentality, man. I mean, they had a mentality on and off the field. Um, And everything they did, they felt – they felt it. They walked it. They talked it. Every piece I, I saw, we could go to practice some. Um, that's who those guys were. That was not the offense personality. And for all his pluses and minuses, um, uh, I think if Drew had kicked some ass and taken some names early, uh, that mentality would have served them well. 
um, against Ohio State and Michigan. Like, I heard you guys talk about it maybe a couple of weeks ago. It's like you got to go in there and think you're good enough. You got to go in there and think you're going to you're going to compete and you can win. Defense certainly thought that. I'm not sure the everybody in offense thought that. And that's a mental thing. That's not a schematic thing. Right. And it, I think it manifests itself a little bit in a schematic thing in the way that Yursich called the offense. It was like we're you know we're going to play on this side of the field and we're going to we're not going to be really super sophisticated because we may not be so you know I think it's that chip on the shoulder it's that chip on the shoulder thing it's like you know uh, was it the Rose Bowl B Bell when you were hurt and you're still in there fighting or Christian it's you like that last drive um, against Michigan you know like. You guys manifested it. You lived it. And I, if there's one thing about Penn State overall, I think that's what's missing on the offensive side of the ball. And for whatever reason, the defense couldn't will that to happen on the offensive side. So I don't know what transpired in the locker room, but it, they looked and played and acted like two different teams. Mm. Mm. That seems to be an overwhelming theme over the last, you know, we, I mean, we always talk about, I said from week one is confidence, confidence and young kids, college football team can go a long way. I'm going to say it probably every episode for as long as this podcast, go, podcast goes. And to hear that from you, as you said, you listen to our perspective, but you can see that you kind of notice the same thing. And I think that's a, uh, I'm not going to say it's a bright side, but it's it's something that could easily be uh, – can be developed, I'll say. And as you as Hack always says, it's not a personnel thing. It's not too much schematics. It all has to be everyone on that same accord that you're talking about. It can't be two split teams, as you said, uh, different mindsets. So interesting to hear hear your your, uh, your thoughts on that. Well, the way Ole Miss – and I didn't go to the game. I was coming right. off surgery. Um, I didn't go to the name, but it, game, but it's, it, you could just tell the way that Ole Miss carried themselves, right? Yeah. Um, and even Kiffin, I got to tell you, I love Kiffin, man. <laughs> yeah. How about when that guy left and he had to, he had right. to tweet about uh, catch and release? <laughs> <laughs> the freaking attitude I want from my coach. Okay, you're here, but we're going to let you go. Right. You know, yeah. And, and and I think that resonates. With kids who are eighteen to twenty one, you go. That's my coach, man. That's my guy. Right. Yeah. I, and and that's that's what I think is going to be really unique. You know, I, me having left early and watching Joe Moorhead, I keep going back to that. But I thought that that season, that offense had that mentality that you're talking about. And then even when Ricky took back over, like, and I love Ricky Ronnie more than most people can even imagine. Like, you still saw some some moments where it was like, again, I, I always compare it to like, you go in there, if I'm going in there to compete, like I'm empty in the clip. And if it's not, if, if, if the results don't come to my favor, like at least I can say I left everything out there right. and I didn't hold my cards. Like I let it all, I shoved all in multiple times. And I thought like you watched Washington last night, Washington did that. I mean, they were, they were up against a, a superior defense, you know, they had probably the best one of the best players on the field and Michael Penix Jr. And he shot a shot and it just didn't quite work out for him. But I respect and commend guys and teams that come in and say, this is who we are. We're going to do this. We believe we can win this game. And at the end of the day, if the result doesn't fall in our favor, like we'll move on and figure it out. And I think that's a lot easier of a pill to swallow. And I think when you see the, the different camps of Penn State fans now, you have the one camp that's like, Oh, we're never going to get there. We got to move on. You have the other camp that's like, oh, we need patience. We need patience. We're going to continue to get fighting this thing. And it's like, at the end of the day, I think it ultimately comes down to something like you said, Bebel is is very correctable. And I'm really interested about this off season. You know, we have some stuff going on in the portal, um, adding some key pieces. But like, I think the expectations are going to be tempered, right? yes. compared speaking to what was even coming into this year. And um, that is a very unique opportunity if leveraged properly in that building. And those are – it's 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 almost like nothing to do with football now. Right, and it's right, more right. of like the mental side and the psyche and Andy Koltenecki coming in here and how can he establish himself within that offense and get them going. Like that's going to be the key to 2024 to me. Is, right. It's not the Jimmys and Joes. It's like 
how can we develop a killer mentality on that side of the ball and attack as opposed to being the guys that have to play defense on the offensive side and be like, oh, they do this really well, so we're afraid of that. Like, right. no, like we're going here and this is what we're going to do. And again, live with the results. So, sorry, I guess. That's very well put. <laughs> Let me ask you guys this question. When you bring up Joe Moorhead, I remember after the last game of the 16th season going into the post game, and I was going to write, you know, this, this story about you know, James bringing everyone together after that Minnesota game. And I kept on going to guys, offense and defense, and they kept on they kept on bringing up Moorhead. And they weren't talking about his offense. They were talking about the belief and the unity. And I thought that was great. And I got to tell you, I'm probably the number one fan of Manny Diaz when he was here. And part of the reason, I love going to practice, and Manny was a great teacher. Mm. every second of practice he's teaching he's interfacing it was like coaching my dad was a high school coach coaching is teaching but yeah. if i had to say in retrospect if there's one thing that manny and it wasn't his place in some ways but manny did not bridge the, he was the guys on defense they swore by him but he didn't bridge the gap and maybe i'm wrong with this brandon he didn't bridge the gap between the defense and the offense the way that joe mo did in 16, to, in that sense, as an, an umbra, bringing everyone under yeah. an umbrella. Yeah, I, I think, not to rebuttal that, but for me it's hard. Like you were at practice way more than I ever was. I think I went to one practice. So that is, a, that is definitely a thing that is what you would like out of a team. Like you said, it's not going to be offense, defense, special teams. It's everyone. And Joe Moorhead definitely did. You know, def, the defense definitely felt his fire. Um just hearing the way he talked to those guys and the way he kind of talked crap to us when we're competing, you know, it brings that, that fiery mentality. Like, you know, they're going to bring it. So we got to bring it. Uh, and it definitely, definitely, there definitely is rollover in that effect. And as you said, I'm not sure if it's his, if anyone's particular job, it's but not, obviously, yeah. obviously yeah. the teams, the teams that reach success, you know, they have that. And it's not just from coaches. Well, one is from all the coaches and all the players. I mean, it's literally the tight end coach, the assistant GA, who's only four years older than most of the kids. He's bringing that mentality. It's it's literally, I know it's cliche, but it's everyone rowing the boat in the same way. Yeah. And not, like I said, we're not knocking Manny Diaz if that, you know, wasn't necessarily part of his uh, coaching repertoire. But those are the things that you would – we all want, you know, we all want yeah. because it, those are things that take you to the promised land. I mean, we ahead. talked about, like, you hit a good point about like Drew, right? Like Drew had a lot of opportunities. And I said this, like good, bad, or indifferent, right? And I think J.J. McCarthy's kind of, and I keep going back to this, this game, but you, when you look at it, like J.J. doesn't, like he's never out there throwing for 300 yards and four or five touchdowns, but he's, in those critical moments, he's making plays. And I don't give him a ton of credit for that, but, yeah. like, he has that – it's like the team's in a lull for three or four series, and then all of a sudden J.J. runs for 34 yards, and then it's a springboard, and then Blake rips off a big one, and then it just starts domino affecting, right, where it's, like, almost internal as well. And I think that there's a lot of growth that can happen. I think Drew can take that by the horns heading into 2024, and I think that would be massive for this team, but not just him. You know, there's other right, guys that right, we have. Right that can kind of pinball off. And it's like, it is a collective effort. It's not just the coaches. It's not just the players. It's collectively developing that mentality of us, us against the world. And that's why I said, I love this perfect storm this off season because it's going to allow, like it is literally playing out picture perfect. You can't write it out anymore in terms of everything from media messaging to what's going on. Like everything is writing up to this perfect storm where if somebody rises mm -hmm. and decides to pull by the horns like that, like this team can be really right. scary next year. And, you know, going back to being results oriented, I think that's it. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Well, I think, I think Allen and, and, and I hear, I hear you be bell. Um, it really was not Manny's job description, but I do think a, a hidden plus of Allen and Colton Nicky are their personalities where you're, you're going to get that crossover total crossover yeah. and another uh, i think dawkins back in year five i think 
on offense, the center. And yeah. I think Devon Alley's coming back yeah. is a huge, huge culture driver. So you add those two guys, and the fact that they're both in the middle of the two lines, yeah. figuratively and literally anchors, and then you throw in Tyler Warren come back. I mean, he could have went, and he was, what, third round maybe? Um, I, those are three captains next year's already. And here's where I want – I'll say in a very broad way, I've had the guys in class. They're for real in every way you can imagine. I don't mind saying on your podcast, those three guys do it right. They're culture drivers. They're foundation guys. They're authentic. Those are, you know, those are the kind of things that exactly what you're saying, Christian, maybe the pressure's off, but those are real. Yeah, yeah. And we talked about it last week with Steph. I mean, anyone can be that guy, that leader, and hopefully you have a bunch that want to be and take, you know, grab grab the team by the horns, as you said, Hack. Uh, and going back to the coaching point, one last point, I do agree with you, uh, Mike, because Coach Pry was like that. In comparison to Bob Shoup, who he came in uh, after, Bob Shoup was great. You know, X and O's, everything was great. But Pry had the, the personality <laughs> that rallied everyone, offense, defense, you know, the, the voice, the beer, I always let them know. I love when the beers grow, grew out, you know, because it just it just does something to the team. And it's like Hack said, it's almost nothing to do with football, X and O's on the field. It's just uh, the aura, the energy that's in the locker room that, you know, when it's a snowy, rainy, dark Wednesday, full padded practice that the energy is there and you go out there and execute like – like it's the biggest game of your life every single week. Those are the little things that bring the team together and keep the keep the the boat moving in the right direction, uh, as we always say. So I do agree with you there, and hopefully, like uh, Hack and I say, we don't know who ne- necessarily listens on the team, but anyone that is, hopefully, they echo this. Anyone can be that that culture driver, as you say, that that confidence builder. It can be. I'm going to shout out Leanne, the nutritionist. I mean, I know she's great, but it can literally be anyone. The equipment manager, the assistant equipment manager guys, Hack and I, we, we still cool with all those guys. You know, every little piece of the of the car driving needs to be, like, perfectly put together. So Yeah, well, I, I'm, I'm bit, like, I'm going to give a shout out. Kenny Sanders, I call him Dr. Kenny because he has a Ph.D. in recruiting. Like, he doesn't just recruit him. He lives with him. Yeah. He's a yeah. huge asset. And and Will Ryman, Moneyball, man, you know, that's kind of the thing. Those guys are below the surface, but I'm all in. Guys like that are super quality. They help drive the culture, too. For sure. For sure. Everyone, man. No doubt. So, listen, Mike, we uh, we are cognizant of your time, and we appreciate it. And we'll, we'll probably be uh, reaching back out at some point in time as this thing continues to progress. But um, – we appreciate the stories. We uh, we appreciate <laughs> you listening. Um, and uh, wrap this up. You know, uh, appreciative of the way you covered me personally, and and I think Brandon probably echoes that as well. I thought it was sure. I thought it was class act, and like you said, it was it was it was really fun to uh, to do that. And now to Brandon's point, have you as a professional friend and peer and and stuff like that. So um, we're looking forward to getting together more often. Yeah. Excellent. Well, great. I'm going to extend one offer here. Okay. Um, next semester, I moved to a bigger auditorium. I have enough an ego to say this matters to me. We're increasing the class size to over 200 people. So it's going to be the biggest sports class at Penn State. Right now, there's a Kines class that's bigger. I would love to have you guys come back and tape a show in class. You can tape a show, and we can wrap it around, and it can be a great learning experience for the kids and hopefully be fun for you too. Sure, That'd be fantastic. And I will probably take you up on that. We'll, we'll, yeah. we'll, that sounds we'll awesome. Work. Thanks for having me guys. Keep it up. Great Have work. You you too. Yeah, that was Mike Portman, the best, uh, for you guys, you know, tried to paint a picture there, but B yeah. and I had a great experience in his class. And, uh, again, it, he, he, he provides such a unique perspective having covered us both, you know, taught us and right. then covered us. He talked about so many different things from journalistic, uh, journalistic integrity and stuff like that. Like he's, he is the best, one of the best out there. And, uh, as a, as a, as a Penn State or a great representative of us. So had to get him out here. Yeah, for sure. Now, now I'm thinking we might make some other professors a little, uh, 
little antsy. Speaking of yeah. uh, Steve Samson, we had his class as well. I forget about you, yep. Steve. If you're listening. Yeah. Got to hop on his pod as well. I, mean, I, I owe him one too. He, yeah. He's reached out to me. I do owe him one. <laughs> we'll make it happen. We'll make it happen. But uh, yeah. yeah, Mike Portman was great. This was another great pod with you, my guy. And um, look forward to keep this thing going. Next week, we'll hopefully get the mailbag Monday. No mailbag this week. I know people are full of questions, but keep this thing rolling out, as we've been saying. And uh, appreciate you guys. Yeah, we can uh, we can treat this as the mailbag, right? So we're heading into the off season. Um, there's obviously some time and some voids we got to <laughs> fill here. So we're going to rely on you guys. Uh, give us some stuff. Like B mentioned, we're going to definitely do some some draft some draft breakdowns of some of the Penn State guys. Um, that'll be fun. You know, you know, good quick hitters for you guys. Try and get some tape and stuff like that to to really dissect it and dive into it. But um, anything you guys have, people you want to hear from so on and so forth. We appreciate it. Make sure you drop it on when we release this on, you know, X or Instagram or whatever, drop it in the comments, give us some suggestions. And as always, make sure you're following us on all our socials, uh, state media PSU on X, uh, Mercury, the mothership. You can get a bunch of great information on college football. You know, Adam Brenneman's out there hustling, trying to get interviews Maybe. from everybody under the sun. So <laughs> there's always good content there. And um, that's a, that's a wrap for this week. So we appreciate it and uh, looking forward to tuning in next week. Peace.